Greetings fellow students. I would like to welcome all of you to the world of education on the unique phenomenons and anomalies known as SCPs. I must apologize if I seem rusty to the subject, for I was just recently given my pass to educate all of you on these unique and misunderstood subjects. My name is Dr. Spawn, and I will be your instructor and guide on this adventure. Before we even delve any deeper, however, as a part of protocol, I must warn you that what I am about to educate you on is not for the faint-hearted. This adventure will be very much disturbing, grotesque, and at some points, even traumatizing. You see, some SCPs are harmless and even appear cute, but there are others that can fool you by appearance and will not hesitate to kill you or even do worse. This will be your last chance to change your mind, shall you not want to proceed further into the lecture. If you wish not to proceed further, walk out now. Alright, just remember that you were warned prior to lecture. Now, let's proceed. If you are aware of the Black Plague, I feel you may find this one interesting. We will be starting with SCP-49. Object class being a Euclid. Let's start by explaining its special containment procedures. I suggest you take notes. SCP-49 is contained within a standard secure humanoid containment cell in Research Sector 2 at Site 19. SCP-49 must be sedated before any attempts to transport it. During transport, SCP-49 must be secured within a Class 3 humanoid restriction harness, including a locking collar and extension restraints, and monitored by no few than two armed guards. While SCP-49 is generally cooperative with most Foundation personnel, outbursts or sudden changes in behavior are to be met with elevated force. Under no circumstances, should any personnel come into direct contact with SCP-49 during these outbursts. In the event SCP-49 becomes aggressive, the application of lavender has been shown to produce a calming effect on the entity. Once calmed, SCP-49 generally becomes compliant and will return to containment with little resistance. In order to facilitate the ongoing containment of SCP-49, the entity is to be provided with the corpse of a recently deceased animal, typically a bovine or other large mammal, once every two weeks for study. Corpses that become instances of SCP-49-2 are to be removed from SCP-49's containment cell and incinerated. SCP-49 is no longer permitted to interact with human subjects, and requests for human subjects are to be denied. Per Containment Committee Order 49-S19.17.1, SCP-49 is no longer permitted to interact directly with any members of Foundation staff, nor is it to be provided with any additional corpses to be used in its surgeries. This order shall persist indefinitely, until such time a consensus regarding the ongoing containment of SCP-49 can be reached. The description of SCP-49 is a humanoid entity roughly 1.9 meters in height which bears the appearance of a medieval plague doctor. While SCP-49 appears to be wearing the thick robes and the ceramic mask indicative of that profession, the garments instead seem to have grown out of SCP-49's body over time and are now nearly indistinguishable from whatever form is beneath them. X-rays indicate that despite this, SCP-49 does have a humanoid skeletal structure beneath its outer layer. SCP-49 is capable of speech in a variety of languages, though tends to prefer English or medieval French. While SCP-49 is generally cordial and cooperative with Foundation staff, it can become especially irritated or at times outright aggressive if it feels that it is in the presence of what it calls the pestilence. Although the exact nature of this pestilence is currently unknown to Foundation researchers, it does seem to be an issue of immense concern to SCP-49. SCP-49 will become hostile with individuals it sees as being affected by the pestilence, 
often having to be restrained should it encounter such. If left unchecked, SCP-49 will generally attempt to kill any such individual. SCP-49 is capable of causing all biological functions of an organism to cease through direct skin contact. How this occurs is currently unknown, and autopsies of SCP-49's victims have invariably been inconclusive. SCP-49 has expressed frustration or remorse after these killings, indicating that they have done little to kill the pestilence though will usually seek to then perform a crude surgery on the corpse using the implements contained within a black doctor's bag it carries on its person at all times. While these surgeries are not always successful, they often result in the creation of instances of SCP-49-2. SCP-49-2 instances are reanimated corpses that have been operated on by SCP-49. These instances do not seem to retain any of their prior memories or mental functions, having only basic motor skills and response mechanisms. While these instances are generally inactive, moving very little, and in a generally ambulatory fashion, they can become extremely aggressive if provoked, or if directed to by SCP-49. SCP-49-2 instances express active biological functions, though these are vastly different from currently understood human physiology. Despite these alterations, SCP-49 often remarks that the subjects have been cured. Addendum 49.1 SCP-49 was discovered during the investigation of a series of unknown disappearances in the town of Montauban in southern France. During a raid on a local home, Investigators found several instances of SCP-49-2 as well as SCP-49. While law enforcement personnel engaged the hostile 49-2 instances, SCP-49 was noted as watching the engagement and taking notes in its journal. After all of the 49-2 instances were dispatched, SCP-49 willingly entered Foundation custody. The following is an interview that was conducted by Dr. Raymond Hamm during the initial investigation. Existence in the world of men, 
and that is the pestilence and nothing else. Make no mistake, they were very ill. All of them. You think you cured those people? Indeed. My cure is most effective. But the things we recovered were not human. Yes, well, it is not a perfect cure, but that will come with time and further experimentation. I have spent a lifetime developing my methods, Dr. Ham, and will spend a lifetime more, if necessary. Now, we have wasted too much time. There is work to do. I will require a laboratory of my own, one where I can continue my research unimpeded. And assistance, of course, though I can provide those on my own. In time. <laughs> oh, I don't think our organization would be willing to- Nonsense. We are all men of science. Fetch your coat and show me to my quarters, Doctor. Our work begins now. The interviewer of SCP-49 made this additional note. While SCP-49 is capable of communicating in a very human way, there is a strange sense of unease that one experiences when in its presence. Make no mistake, there is something very uncanny about this entity indeed. Additionally, we've confiscated that pointed stick that SCP-49 keeps waving around. Part of this was due to standard confiscation protocols for the possessions of anomalies, and part because 49 really is a menace swinging it around like he does. The entity was displeased at first, but after we made some concessions in providing it with test subjects, which are admittedly more for the benefit of our own research, it warmed up to the idea. Addendum 49.2 while in containment at Site-19, SCP-49 has spent a considerable amount of time studying and performing surgery on the various mammalian corpses it has been provided. SCP-49 will routinely spend several days performing surgery, and then, regardless of whether or not the corpse becomes an instance of SCP-49-2, spending several more days documenting its findings in a thick leather journal stored within its doctor's bag. SCP-49 will often seek to share its findings with members of Foundation staff. The following is a log of several occasions where which SCP-49 was observed operating on a mammalian corpse. Observational Log 49.0L.1 Preface A test subject D-85123 was introduced into SCP-49's containment cell. The entity expressed sincere gratitude towards all members of the containment and research staff. Observation Notes SCP-49 began by asking D-85123 several standard medical questions as it began removing tools from its bag. Shortly after finishing its preparations, SCP-49 quickly closed the distance between the two, killing the subject with a touch to its throat. Afterwards, SCP-49 made a number of considerable alterations to the basic structure of the subject's corpse, often introducing fluids from within its bag into the subject by way of a hand-powered pump and copper tubing. The resulting 49-2 instance became animated, flailing and grasping at the walls of the chamber with a number of manufactured limbs while moaning out of an oblong orifice now present in its sternum. During this time, SCP-49 was observed taking notes of the instance in its journal and remarking to the watching research staff about the efficacy of its cure. Security personnel entered the chamber to move SCP-49 back to containment and were attacked by the instance. The security team dispatched the 49-2 instance, and SCP-49 returned to containment with no resistance, stating that it was pleased with the results.
Observational Log 49.0L.2 Preface SCP-49 was provided the corpse of a recently deceased goat. SCP-49 expressed gratitude at this provision. Observation Notes SCP-49 operated on the goat corpse for several days, eventually resulting in an instance of SCP-49-2. SCP-49 expressed pleasure in this outcome, though admitted. The disease was still in its nascent stage. My veterinarian practice is rudimentary, but the patient responded well to the procedure. Observational Log 49.0L.3 Preface SCP-49 was provided to the corpse of a recently deceased orangutan. SCP-49 expressed noted gratitude at the provision due to the similarities between the orangutan and common human physiology. Observation Notes SCP-49 spent several days operating on the orangutan, reanimating it several times. However, SCP-49 appeared to be discontent with the results it experienced, returning to the creature three times after its initial reanimation for additional work. After it was unable to reanimate the corpse a fifth time, SCP-49 turned the corpse over to Foundation staff for incineration, stating, I have learned so much from this, though I fear my early optimism was misplaced. I hadn't yet come across such a... a stumbling block on my road to the cure. More subjects like this would do a great deal in advancing my research. Observational Log 49.0L.7 Preface SCP-49 was provided the corpse of a recently deceased bovine. SCP-49 expressed mild annoyance at the provision, though accepted it nonetheless. Observation Notes SCP-49 spent several days operating on the bovine corpse, breaking only to dine on a requested dinner of thin crackers, salted pork, and hard cheese. Beginning first by embalming the corpse, SCP-49 was observed producing a number of long syringes from its bag, each containing a different dark, viscous liquid. SCP-49 described these fluids as essences of the humors and elaborated by saying, The pestilence may bring about a systematic imbalance. In such a case, before true healing can begin, one must find the rumors in balance or the body will reject the cure. Over the next few days, SCP-49 spent a considerable amount of time adjusting the organs of the bovine corpse with a number of large metal instruments. After eight days, SCP-49 produced a lightning rod, which Dr. Ham exchanged for an electric cattle prod attached to an extension cord and struck the corpse in several locations. This action seemingly had the effect of reanimating the bovine, which once again became ambulatory, despite the inversion of the head and reorientation of its limbs. The following is a follow-up interview regarding the experimentations of SCP-49. Take a listen. We watched you work for uh, several weeks now, and honestly, I I'm not sure I understand what you're doing. Could you describe your process in detail? Oh, goodness, no. The process is most intensive. As I said to your assistant, the best instruction you will find about my methods are here, in my journals, as I have kept exhaustive records of my work there. Oh, I see. Well, my concern, Doctor, is that we still don't understand what you're seeking to cure, or how it manifests, or how turning these creatures into quasi-living, mindless drones helps in that effort. You do not understand the pestilence, even after all this time. Doctor, it is an unspeakable horror, one that has shown its true face many times before, and will again. I find myself blessed 
where your wisdom and good sense is needed to root it out and destroy it. But many, like yourself, cannot. It is a cruel judgment, I fear, to be at the mercy of a disease you cannot fully comprehend. That still doesn't answer my question. How's your cure any kind of cure at all? It is a cure. You may laugh at my efforts if you please, but do not besmirch the good name of scientific progress that has developed this great mercy. What you short-sightedly see here is a life better than any this creature could have hoped for. Stricken as it was with the pestilence, this creature is now clean, unable to spread the pestilence, and free from the terror it would have experienced otherwise. This is hardly a creature at all, Doctor. It's not even- Do not gape with me, sir. You and your colleagues are like so many others, unable to look past minor setbacks to see the salvation taking place before your very eyes. Do you wait to remove rotten timbers until the hall collapses on top of you? No. You find them and you pull them out and replace them with those untouched by rot. And most of all, you do not simply mock the structure because it now looks different to you. It is strong. It is free of disease. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to agitate you. I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Yes. Well, do mind your words in the future, Doctor. I am a professional, but even professionals may feel the bite of pride in dealing with criticism of their masterpiece. I will forgive this as an act of good faith between colleagues. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, that will be all. Another test subject on the usual schedule. You know my preference of subjects with more human anatomies. One of the attending researchers noted the following. SCP-49 does seem to genuinely want to help other humans, though it has not yet been able to provide a concrete example of what exactly it is trying to save us all from. I have watched it now over several weeks, and while the outcomes do not seem to ever change, SCP-49 continues to claim that it is growing closer to its perfect cure. I think the entity may be more aware of the reality of these outcomes than it would like us to think. Addendum 49.3 Starting shortly after SCP-49's initial containment, Dr. Ham conducted a number of interviews with the subject regarding its anomalous properties, and over time began to note its displeasure with its subjects and the SCP-49-2 instances. This continued for a period of several months, which SCP-49 never exhibited any aggressive behaviors. On April 16, 2017, as Dr. Ham was entering SCP-49's test chamber to conduct another routine interview, the entity began to grow anxious and asked Dr. Ham if he was feeling well. Following protocol, Dr. Ham reminded SCP-49 that the interview was required, after which the entity became hostile and attacked Dr. Ham, killing him. Due to a lapse in security protocol, and because Dr. Ham did not activate the in-chamber emergency system, Dr. Ham's corpse was not discovered until three hours later, by which point SCP-49 had converted it into an instance of SCP-49-2. In the aftermath of this incident, SCP-49 was interviewed by Dr. Theron Sherman. I need you to explain yourself. SCP-049, you are being directed to explain your actions, and I will remind you that failure to cooperate will result in further restrictions during your containment. My actions do not need to be explained. You killed Raymond Ham, and then butchered him until he- Not dead. 
No, not, not dead. He is, he is cured. Cured? Cured of what? The pestilence, sir. I had thought you, at least, would realize what luck it is. I detected it before. What pestilence? You keep going on and on about this pestilence, but you have not once been able to properly identify this disease. What could you have possibly seen in him today that you had not seen so many times before? That it would be worth his life? He... The pestilence presents and progresses in unforeseeable fashions, and has a queer way of... of creeping into the unprepared. And... Call it what you want, Doctor. It was a mercy I did to him. He is cured. He is a vegetable. I... I would not expect you to understand. You and your... your ilk have proven time and time again not to be men of science, but men of... of emotion. You cannot appreciate the horrors I have seen. Those many millions who have succumbed to the pestilence and been changed. Your cure cost Ray his life. No, good sir. I have saved it. You will allow this world to slip back into the, the despair of disease and death, ignoring that I have created a miracle. And what disease? What pestilence? He was a healthy man. He was a good doctor. I'm offering it freely to the afflicted. You are not worth this argument, sir. You are short-sighted and foolish. Dr. Ham was sick and I... I cured him. I am the only one who can do this. My work must continue. There is still so much to learn, so much I've had enough of this. And Consider your allowances be saved. Even you. Welcome to containment, you 049. Might be saved. We're done here. I can save them all. I can cast down this plague once and for all. I can do this. Only me. I am. I saved him. I saved him. <sighs> Dr. Ham. I... I cured him. He was sick. I know he was sick. I know he was. And I... You are all sick. But I... I can save you. I can save all of you. Because I... I... am the cure. Addendum 49.4 The following interview is an excerpt from the 4-16-17-49 Incident Report. The interview was conducted by Dr. Elisha Itkin, which took place three weeks after the start of the initial investigation. Take a listen. SCP-049, we are conducting this interview to close out our investigation of your actions taken on April 16th that resulted in the death of a staff member. Do you have any comments to make? Only that I look forward to the day when you will allow me to resume my work. I have spent the last few weeks compiling my notes and constructing a new theory for how the pestilence was able to infect someone in such an insidious manner that I nearly couldn't detect it. Have you experienced any remorse for your actions? For the death of Dr. Ham? Ah, yes. Well, the death of a colleague is always regrettable. But in the face of the pestilence, we must be swift, Doctor, and act without hesitation. Dr. Sherman noted in his report that you seemed to be mournful during your initial interview. Mourn? Perhaps. I had not thought that. It is lamentable that a fellow doctor became infected, but the work continues. Regrettable as, as it was, Dr. Ham's death provided important insight. Living human subjects are the only way to proceed forward, I have decided. My cure is of little use on dead flesh, and I have gleaned all I can from your generous supply of corpses. 
My desires turn towards tending to those still living who suffer from the disease. I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> oh, Doctor. I wouldn't be so sure. To conclude our lesson, the following are some footnotes that were documented by a variety of doctors and researchers on SCP-49. To prevent any repetition of the 41617 incident. Footnote 1. The robes and gloves are identical to a thick hide built upon the skin, while the mask is composed of a kind of chitin growing out of the bones of the face. Footnote 2. The entity claims to have originated in 15th century France, though admits that it is particularly well-traveled. Footnote 3. The space within his bag is seemingly anomalously large, as SCP-49 has been observed pulling objects larger than the bag itself from within it in order to operate on deceased subjects. Footnote 4. SCP-49 has stated its desire to work on human subjects several times between this occasion and the earlier provision of an orangutan, noting its discontentedness when they would not be provided. Footnote 5 SCP-49 has expressed that it does not require sustenance, but enjoys it and feels that the food helps to put it in the right mind to operate. Footnote 6 SCP-49 added to this statement by saying, this is, of course, elementary knowledge for the practical physician. I would have thought you would have learned this during your education. Footnote 7 Notably, SCP-49's journals are not written in any known language, and attempts by linguists and codebreakers to decipher them have been unsuccessful. That concludes our lecture for today. I hope you all learned something in regards to SCP-49's case, and I hope to see your bright faces and bright minds back for more education on SCPs. You are dismissed. Have a good day.